<laughs> I spent most of my time doing a kind of market research or field study where I have an idea. Okay. There were these kids in Portland that were screwing around on the roof of a, of a Fred Meyer supermarket late at night. There were people who worked there. And one of them, they were stoned, and one of them jumped off the hood of his car, slid off, but in doing so, he, he somehow got the antenna rammed into his eye, into his brain, two or three inches into his brain. And it was a big story in Portland how this kid wasn't brain damaged. They were able to remove this antenna from his brain. But I started thinking, what if the kid, instead of removing it, he found that if he moved it in a certain way, it would create pleasure. It would stimulate brain centers that would provide fantastic pleasure. But because the brain has no pain receptors, it was also destroying his brain. He was basically, if you took biology in high school, he was pithing himself. He was scrambling his brain as he was seeking more and more pleasure. And he was basically scrambling his eggs in pursuit of pleasure. That was really complicated. <laughs> so I thought, what about just these kids, this kid, this really smart kid who sees that life is not going to be as easy as he thinks it's going to be. And he goes to the health room one day with a headache and he sees the defibrillator on the wall and he decides, I'll just take one adhesive patch and put it here. I'll take the other one, I'll put it here. I'll press that button, and when it's up to a full strength, zap. I w will never worry about another thing. I'll be a lobotomized, happy vegetable for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I mentioned that to my trainer. I said, Chris, what about this guy that lobotomizes himself with this, uh, this defibrillator? And he liked it. He liked the idea. He said, that's a good idea. And I didn't do another thing with it. <laughs> and a year later, out of nowhere, Chris goes, you know that defibrillator story? Did you ever do anything with that? I thought, yeah, you know, that was a good idea. The fact that Chris D'Amato would retain that idea for an entire year and bring it back to me. That was proof that it was worth pursuing. So, so, so much of my life is this, and eventually that story became the story uh, Zombies that I read on tour last year and it would make people weep openly. It turned out to be a great little story. And uh, so, so much of my life is is this process of identifying really compelling narratives, tiny mini narratives, and then throwing them back out into the culture like bait to attract bigger narratives. Okay, when I worked at Freightliner, my first year on the assembly line, my first day, my foreman said, go to this other station and get our squeegee sharpener and don't take any bullshit because we need it back. They've had it for months. So I got sent up the line to some gruff guy to ask for a squeegee sharpener, and he tore me a new asshole. And he almost made me cry, and he said that the squeegee sharpener had been lent to some other workstation. And I spent the entire day bouncing from one yelling guy to another yelling guy. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I, the only thing I learned was that there is no such thing as a squeegee sharpener. <laughs> and I met every foreman that I might ever work for, and I... I learned the entire layout of the plant. And I would tell that stories at parties, and everyone has got a version of that story. And forgive me, I'm going to fast forward. I got hundreds of versions. That, you work at TGI, TGI Fridays. Your first day, they send you for the banana peeler. You have to ask everyone. If you work... Uh, um, if you work at Target, they send you for the, sh the shelf stretchers. And finally, I, I told a series of these stories. I've got hundreds. I told it in France, and a man, a very elegantly dressed professional, came up, and he gave me his card. He was a veterinarian. And he said, I am, a, a, how you say, an animal doctor. 
And he says, I liked your story because it took me seven years to get into the Academy of Veterinary Sciences. It's an incredibly competitive program. And when I was finally admitted, they threw a party for me. All of my advisors, my professors, in one of the dissection labs late at night through this big drinking party. And we drank and we drank and we drank. And eventually I passed out. And what I didn't know is that is part of this hazing ritual for the, this program is that if you don't pass out from the drinking, they put ketamine in your wine. <laughs> and you do pass out. And then all of your professors, your advisors, all these esteemed colleagues, take all of your clothes off. And then they bunch you up like a little naked fetus. Three o'clock in the morning in this big tiled laboratory. And then they very carefully stuff you and sew you inside the belly of a gutted dead horse. <laughs> and he says, when you wake up, you have no idea where you're at. <laughs> and you're cold, you're so cold, and it stinks, and it's dark, and you just want to puke because of whatever they've given you. You're so sick, and you're shaking, and you can hear them out in the darkness somewhere, and they're still laughing. <laughs> and when they see you move, when they see the skin of the horse move, they all start screaming in French. And they're screaming, you think you can just fill out some forms and you can be one of us. You think you, it's just a matter of filling out some forms and saying the right thing and doing a good interview and you can be a French veterinarian. Well, it's not that easy. You have got to fight to be in this program. You have got to fight like you've never fought before. And they're all screaming, fight, fight, fight. And you start to push against this stretchy, stinky darkness. And eventually you pop an, an arm out and your naked, bloody arm pops out and you feel them put a glass of wine in your hand. <laughs> And you have to birth yourself in this horrible, dead, cold thing, naked in front of all of them. And they all cheer you. And the purpose of this, he says, is that everyone in the program has undergone this same rite of passage. So that in the future, no matter how many little puppies and kitties die on you, no matter how bad your day is, it's never going to be as bad as waking up inside <laughs> a dead horse. And so, instead of writing 50,000 words a day, you know, instead of sitting on the toilet saying, I'm going to pass something, whether or not I've got something to pass, <laughs> my job is so much more of a kind of social field study to try to find patterns in the ways in which people live their lives and to take the best examples of those patterns and to quilt them together and make something. So that's my, my method. I've been asking that question for years. I think you just gave the most brilliant answer I've ever heard of it, by the way. Um, 